Hello everyone, thanks for clicking on today's video. My name is Sissy and I love arts and crafts and sharing my silly thoughts on random things. I've been sewing a long time, though I admit most of it is self-taught and most of the items are fairly simple. <laughs> I think overall my favorite things to make are doll clothes, I'll have a video or two on that another time, but another fun thing to make is an apron. Aprons I feel like are one of those staples that everyone needs in their house but don't necessarily want or wear. <laughs> they are great for baking, especially when you accidentally sneeze and the flour gets everywhere, or a fan turns on and the flour gets everywhere, or you accidentally spill an entire cup of flour everywhere, or, well, you get the idea. Flour gets into everything. <laughs> there was one day I was baking and my husband comes home from work. I thought I had been sneaky, aside from the smell, of course, because I had thoroughly cleaned up and hid the baked goods away, or so I had thought. My husband walks in the door, and before he can even sniff the air, he smiles at me and says, You've been baking, haven't you? I was like, Yeah, you smelled it, didn't you? He goes, Well, yeah, but there's also a lot of flour in your hair. Yeah, that's how I bake, folks. The flour gets everywhere. <laughs> Back to the aprons, sorry. Aprons are important, even if they don't protect your hair, <laughs> but they are also fun to make because you can do so many different styles out of all kinds of fabrics and patterns and colors, and for the most part, they are one size, which makes it easy to sew. Now you can make fancy custom aprons that fit just right, but it's just as easy to make a one-size-fits-all. The first pattern wasn't the easiest apron to make, as that ruffle decided to give me all kinds of trouble. Sometimes pieces just don't want to work, you know? But the next two aprons, one child-sized and one adult, were fun to make. The best part about these patterns? The child and adult pattern was another one from my mom's stash, and I remember when she made matching aprons for myself and her, and put these darling little wooden spoons in the pockets and cookie cutters, and they were adorable. I remember she also used to make aprons for other kids as gifts out of all the kinds of patterned fabrics, and they were so cute! Not to mention they are a fairly quick project. I can make each apron in less than a full day, which is saying something. That first one though, oh man, that ruffle. Good thing it came out cute, and I don't know about you, but watermelons always make me happy. Do you ever have a few things where no matter what kind of day you're having, you look at it and smile and go, yeah, that's cute. Watermelons are one of those things for me. I don't know why they're just a cute fruit. <laughs> also, I apologize for Waba Fett making an appearance on my finger in today's video. You might also see him in other videos I film because if I finish one project early enough in the day, you bet your bottom dollar I'm starting another one the same day. I try to be as efficient as possible. Waba Fit is hanging out with me because I sliced my finger across the knuckle on the lid of a pie filling can. You know that spot where it's not exactly lethal or anything, especially this cut because it's super shallow and doesn't need a stitch, but that knuckle line bleeds like crazy and it hurts like crazy too? Yeah, I get a little clumsy sometimes and often wonder when I had my last tetanus shot. I'm sure I'm fine. <laughs> Today's topic goes a little bit into the way I understand how pianos have become a household name. Alright friends, to accompany this ridiculous title, I will give you a disclaimer. I did not do any research for this topic. Nope. As I say in the beginning of every video, this is just my silly thoughts and truly just my thoughts out loud. What I'm relaying to you is what I remember learning as a kid. Could be totally legit, it could be completely false, but this is the story I'm going to share with you today. Please don't take my word for this. Look it up yourself if you're curious. I personally think it's awesome to do your own research on things. I think it's nice to get factual information from legitimate sources and go on your own way. This is also not a history channel, keep that in mind. So that being said, let's get into the story. A long time ago, there was this dude named Beethoven who wrote a lot of music that is still extremely popular today. And no, for those of you who know, I'm talking about the composer, not the dog. <laughs> anyway, Beethoven was a dude who I honestly think he was born sick, but I could be wrong on that. Again, do not quote me on anything here. But his health certainly dwindled as he got older and ended up becoming deaf in his adulthood from... I want to say tuberculosis, but I'm not 100% sure. Either way, the older he got, the more deaf he became, and he was looking for something more from his instrument of choice. Although it had been invented at this point, the pianoforte, or the piano as we know it today, hadn't really taken off in massive popularity yet. Pre-Beethoven and during his youth, the harpsichord, a predecessor to the piano, was still the norm. Intimate settings with harpsichords and a few stringed instruments like the violin and cello were still very popular for entertainment. I'm sure you've heard of quartets or quintets, etc., and these groups of intimate performers would sometimes or often include the harpsichord. It was a great instrument that could stand on its own or accompany a singer or a violin or something like that. 
So for those of you who don't know, the harpsichord is the predecessor to a piano or pianoforte and acts very similarly to a harp where the strings of the instrument are plucked. However, unlike a harp, you use a keyboard to press the keys and those keys have like a little hook on the back of them that deploy when you press the key and each hook attached to each key plucks the, each string. In fact, that plucking is what gives a more unique sound compared to the piano because it gives off a plunking or tinkling sound, again, similar to the harp, compared to a more smooth, full, I like to say lush sound of the piano. Check it out sometime. Listen to some harpsichord pieces. Not everyone today finds it pretty, but I enjoy it. If you put a harpsichord or piano on their side, specifically a grand or baby grand piano, not an upright, you will find that they are shaped very much like a harp, which was the inspiration for both instruments. Pretty cool. Anyway, the frustration that Beethoven and others like him had with the harpsichord, which is still played in some circles today, I've played it and love it, is that the volume adjuster on the harpsichord is fairly limited. Pretty much, no matter how much pressure you exert on those keys, like how hard you bang down, but please don't bang down on any keyboard, you aren't going to get a big difference in that volume. I forgot to mention here that to compensate, harpsichords would sometimes have two keyboards, a quote unquote loud one and soft one. But I will be honest with you when I tell you I personally feel the difference is subtle. So Beethoven and company wanted more. These dudes wanted to get the varying volume you can get out of other instruments and put it into this cool, funky keyboard where you had notes all over the place. Thus, the pianoforte was born and Beethoven found out about it because our dude wanted more. He wanted volume. He wanted a range in sound. And a lot of people think that was because he could better hear the rhythm. The fact that this guy could make entire orchestral scores completely in his head without hearing any of it is so mind boggling to me. And it's just absolutely incredible. Anyway, he starts fiddling around with this pianoforte. Now, why does this make a difference, you ask? The piano works in a different way from a harpsichord. Remember how I said that a harpsichord uses little hook-like devices to pluck the strings like a harpist would use their fingers on a harp? Well, a piano or pianoforte uses hammers. That's right, hammers. When you press down on a key, like I totally encourage you to take a look at a piano after this, and you can see that when you press down on a key, it deploys this little hammer. It looks like a little block of wood on the end of a stick covered in felt so you don't get a nasty sound. And this little hammer essentially bonks the string, making it vibrate, and depending on the size of the string, gives a different pitch or tone of sound. That part has to do with science and airwaves and all that, but it's still really cool. What is also super cool is that by using these little hammers, one can better adjust the volume of the tone, hence the name pianoforte or piano for short. In Italian, piano means soft and forte means loud. You're literally playing an instrument called soft loud. And that's the power that Beethoven loved because the ability to alter the volume or dynamics as they are called in music theory of a piece of music on the piano made it such a vital accessory or even soloist in a piece. So as far as I understand, although again, he wasn't the inventor, he could certainly bring the pianoforte or piano to the forefront and took off in popularity. Orchestral venues with a lot of instruments were becoming popular and the piano was a great fit for those settings, whether it's a solo instrument or as a team player, as I'll go into detail more in a bit. You started to see the piano show up in well-to-do family homes where sons and daughters learned to play the pianoforte. You also saw it become a major soloist and be instrumental in the increasingly popular orchestra, which featured a large variety of instruments to create incredible pieces of music that are still played today. Some of Beethoven's most famous works have heavily influenced so many people throughout the years still to this day. I know famous rock bands have said that Beethoven has influenced them. I think it's maybe Led Zeppelin that said that. I don't remember. Take what I say with a grain of salt, but I know there have been bands that have mentioned it. Did you know that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know the one, the da 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 da, it's probably the most famous opening liner ever? Yeah, no joke. How incredibly cool is that? What I find amazing about the piano and other instruments I know, I'll probably touch on those another day, is the fact that this versatile instrument is everywhere and in so much music. The only thing is, I think that full-sized grand pianos are still very expensive and seem to only find their ways into expensive homes or fancy hotels and things like that. I saw three on a cruise I was on recently. It was like, that's cool. But I have to give credit where credit is due, and this might be a little controversial for those diehard musicians out there. I love the electric keyboard. I know. For those of you purest pianists out there, I felt you all grasp at your pearls and take the biggest inhale of your life. Blasphemous, I know. I do love the electric keyboard though, and here's why. Back in the 80s, when they discovered electricity, apparently, <laughs> electronic instruments quickly became a thing and took off like crazy. I know, they had been invented before this, but I really feel like 80s bands and musicians were what brought all the electronic instruments into true fame, especially the electric keyboard. 
Oh my goodness, if you listen closely to original electric keyboards, you can understand why certain people have contention with them, especially since most of them don't sound remotely like a piano. <laughs> However, with the way technology has progressed, not only can you get quality piano sounds, but the weight of the keys are very nice today too. One of the big complaints about keyboards is that they were not weighted. So when you press on the keys of a quote unquote real piano, you will definitely feel some resistance, which was why one of the biggest complaints out there about the electronic keyboards, besides the sound, of course, was that it didn't feel like a piano. But there's so many electronic keyboards out there today that not only have the right number of keys, that was another thing, gotta have your 88 keys, <laughs> but they also sound incredible and you can still do all your funky beats with them. Some electronic keyboards even look like the real thing, and some of those are hard to tell apart. My thing about the keyboard is if you have one, even if it's only 20 keys and sounds like a kid's toy dying on its last battery, play it. I want you to learn it. Play it. and Go forth, my friend. Especially if you have any desire to learn music or even just want to appreciate music more, please play away. The piano is such a cool instrument because it's a gateway into playing anything else. I promise you, if you can play the piano, you can play anything, even the kazoo or the triangle. That triangle, man, an orchestra is nothing without it. <laughs> Jokes aside, because I'm not knocking the triangle, those percussionists work gosh darn hard. The piano is super cool. Speaking of orchestras, there are arguments out there on where the piano sits in the orchestra families. Yep, even the orchestra is divided into sections or families. You've got your winds, your brass, your strings, your percussion, which is a super cool section because that's where all the randos and misfits live, but they are all super important instruments for as little as a single measure or teeny tiny little bit of like a four hour long epic score, another name for a piece of music, like the triangle. <laughs> but what is super cool about a piano is that because of its extreme versatility, where it can accompany a solo, be the soloist, or enhance another instrument by playing the same notes and giving sustenance, it is sometimes considered to be a percussive instrument, especially because it has hammers to hit the strings. However, its ancestry did begin with the strings, like the harp and violin, and it's got strings, so isn't it a stringed instrument, some say? I say it depends on the piece of music. If you have an orchestral piece where it's called a literal piano concerto, then a, yeah, buddy, the piano is a soloist and is a stringed instrument. Scoot over first chair violin, the piano has the stage. However, if you have an orchestral piece where I mentioned before the piano is giving extra meat to accompany a soloist or to give extra oomph to a particular section, it could be more of a percussive instrument or just a buddy hanging out with the strings. Often you won't even see a piano with an orchestra unless it is soloing, so it totally depends. But yeah. Whether you are totally bougie with your Steinway sitting front and center in the living room with a butler beside it, or whether you picked up your keyboard at the toy store, I encourage you to check it out. Even if you just learned chopsticks on the piano, please play. Play away. Enjoy it. Have fun. Experiment with those volumes like our good friend Beethoven did with his fortissimos and pianissimos. Very loud and very soft in English. And remember, you don't have to be a virtuoso to play and enjoy music. Just have fun. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you so much for listening. Please like and subscribe. Have an amazing day and I'll talk to you again soon.